feral cats, a problem with a solution. Caticos. Pepita. Once upon a time, there was a cat colony that made the streets their home, supplying themselves with whatever their surroundings provided. It's a secret to no one that the proliferation of cats in vacant lots, parks, roofs, and open spaces is on the rise. Many people, upon seeing that their pets have babies, think the best option is to leave the newborns to fend for themselves and that other people should solve the problem, which turns into a setback for society. This is occurring more and more often all around the world, and so we set out to investigate and learn more about this phenomenon. Feral cats. A problem with a solution. In the neighborhood of Belén, on the west side of Medellín, lives Luis Alfonso Montoya, a teacher who loves rock and roll and animals, so much that he sought to protect the San Bernardo colony, a group of feral cats that live on the rooftops of his neighborhood. This colony began about 12 years ago when I arrived here at my parents' house and saw that the house's woodwork was totally dilapidated. I moved into the house and observed two, three cats, and out of love, I repaired the stairway first so I could go up and feed them. As a result, others started to arrive, and they began to reproduce. From that point on, I maintained close contact with them and began to name them and assume responsibility for them, like part of my family. These groups of cats proliferate in our communities, which is why we consulted a specialist in environmental education, veterinarian Carmen Patricia Cadena. Feral cats are part of the synanthropic fauna of cities. The synanthropic fauna, as implied by its name, are those animals that grow and reproduce and live around humans. This means that as urban zones have grown, the synanthropic fauna has grown with them. And why do they grow? Because they come to depend on the voluntary or involuntary availability of food left behind by humans. As the veterinarian correctly pointed out, it's a phenomena created by humans, and the inclination is to aggressively eradicate them by poisoning them or sending them to local animal shelters so they can be picked up. But this is not the solution to the problem. For us, euthanasia is not to be used as a method of population control. It's a method that requires medical and ethical consideration and should only be performed when the animal is suffering, doesn't allow for a certain quality of life or dignity. We also do not permit indiscriminate rounding up of the animals because we believe that these animals have the same rights as we do to coexist and reside in this area. Part of the solution are the people who, out of pure love, take care of these colonies after receiving training to manage this type of street fauna. Common sense shows us that these little animals procreate and reproduce at an impressive rate. Because of this, a friend put me in touch with the Center for Animal Welfare La Perla. And, thanks to the assistance of Dr. Patricia Cadena, from that point forward, we have been able to sterilize and vaccinate the cats. Which makes me very happy, because, if you can imagine, every two or three months, I would see six, seven new cats. But, through this partnership to sterilize the cats, the cats are now normal cats, but they haven't come back to me with more kittens. For Luis Alfonso, who lives with his wife, another teacher, things have been going very well and the colony continues its existence, surrounded by an environment of roofs, bricks, cements, and cans. Part of this work is to seek protection for all of the animal populations that make up the fauna, domestic, wild, 
or exotic that exists in cities and urban areas, which is the reason for this intervention. The program mainly involves controlling their reproduction to guarantee that they don't keep multiplying so that in a few years their offspring don't increase the population to the point where it's out of control. This is also to ensure their well-being since the more animals there are in the street, the less resources exist for them and they begin to compete for resources like food and water and space. Thus, the fact that an animal lives in the streets or on a block, sterilized, and with its basic needs guaranteed means that it will keep other animals from entering and like I said before, one way or another, they're going to create a sanitary and territorial barrier and rules for that area. When Luis returned to his parents' house, he found a colony of cats living on the rooftops of his and his neighbors' homes. This led him to seek professional help to learn how to deal with this phenomenon without altering these animals' lives. They pretty much know that my house is their supply center. I mean, they come here, eat, use the litter box, find water, and are taken care of. Behind you, up there, underneath the shingles, there's a little house where they can enter and have a place to stay. There they can also, I mean, up there, underneath the same shingles, they find shelter in little cubby holes and walk this whole block and haven't had any problems. Once the situation was understood, the logistics were put in place to control the colony, and specialists took steps to get these cats rescued. The protocol consists of identifying the animals, identifying the environmental conditions that were conducive to them being here, after which we can move to a second phase where the animals are captured, ethically captured, because it is done in a way that respects the animals' lives as cats, as felines. With a little trap in which food and water is placed, the cats are attracted, and afterwards, when they're in the trap, they're taken to La Perla, where they are cleaned up and given medical attention, which consists of a health diagnosis, tests for leukemia, HIV, as well as other tests for parasites. If the animal passes these tests, it is put on a program of specialized veterinary attention that includes vaccinations, internal and external deworming, the implanting of a microchip, and sterilization. Finally, the animal is reintroduced to its habitat, returned to its place, to the place it was before. First, a clinical evaluation is performed to make sure that the animal doesn't have diseases or wounds to make sure it's healthy. After that, laboratory tests are performed, such as blood tests, viral tests to check for AIDS and leukemia, blood panels, and comprehensive tests for microplasma, all of which ensures the patient's health is guaranteed. Of all of those tests, one of the most important is the AIDS and leukemia test. These illnesses are infectious diseases among cats and they can cause big problems for them. They are diseases that cause immunodeficiency disorders or predispose the cats to the formation of tumors and that sort of thing. The contagion can spread through sexual contact, through intercourse, or they can be spread via wounds or bites when they fight. It's a very delicate situation, which is why we have to take care to assess these patients and make sure they don't have these types of diseases in order to be able to return them to their colonies and guarantee that the colonies consist of healthy animals. On top of that, we perform blood panel tests and when necessary, we perform other exams like blood chemistry screenings. Why do we do this? To be able to move the patient to surgery, we have to be certain that they are healthy, that they don't have any type of disease that could affect them in surgery, so that the procedure can have the best possible result and avoid the risks associated with anesthesia and the like. After we perform the tests that are part of the assessment and determine the patient is healthy enough to be operated on and reintegrated, we do the following. First of all, we vaccinate. They receive a rabies vaccination, which is mandatory 
mandatory by law. They're also vaccinated against other diseases such as leukemia, and they're given the triple feline vaccine, which protects against infectious diseases that specifically affect cats. In addition to vaccinations, we complete the rest of the health plan, including deworming with a vermifuge treatment and removing ectoparasites like fleas and ticks. Also importantly, each patient, every feral cat that comes here, has a microchip implanted. The final step of the process is to implant the cats with a chip that will be fundamental to keeping track of them in the colony. This microchip is an identification system. Basically, what does this chip do? The microchip is made up of is this tiny capsule that is found here on the tip of the needle. This microchip allows us to generate a unique number. With this number, we can identify the patient. This is sterile. It's not going to cause any reaction in the body or anything, and it will stay there for life. Therefore, with this microchip, we'll be able to identify the patient during its entire life. We'll be able to know its clinical history and know exactly who each animal is. Before, in order to know which cat had been admitted for treatment, they were tattooed or given a tiny notch on one of its ears. Now we just use a microchip to identify them. After all of these procedures are performed, the patient is immediately placed into surgery. Once it's guaranteed they're healthy, that the exams came out well and everything, in surgery we neuter them. We use the following sterilization techniques. Orchiectomy for the males, which is castration, and the females undergo a lateral OVH. We use the lateral technique because we've seen that it's much safer, they recover more rapidly, and there are less complications with this than with the ventral OVH, which is another technique used for the sterilization of cats. After sterilization, the patient normally stays from one day to the next here in the health center in order to make sure they recover from the anesthesia and they can be freed in an appropriate way. And after all of this, the next day, they are taken to the colony or their place, the site where they are to be freed, and they are released to their point of origin. However, in spite of the advantages technology brings, this teacher doesn't need technology to identify the 14 members of his colony, since he has a name for all of them, from owl to snow. Here's Rajo. Here's Pepita. Here's Tiger. Here's Vaquita. Here's Mascarita. All the names are more or less of this type. They are fun names for the cats. I name each one according to its physical makeup. That one. That one in the back, black with bits of yellow. That one's Ash. The ages of these cats range from 6 months to 10 years old, and they live with the other animals without any problem. Sometimes the difficulty in coexisting is with us humans. These cats, it's so interesting. These cats hang from the necks of the dogs here, from here to there, just to laugh at getting them to bark. But not one. Even when the cats fall into the neighbor's patios, they call me to go get them, and the dogs don't bite them. They just bark at them, because dogs bark at them in any case. That's what they say about the cats, but to me it's strange, because, for example, in my house I have butterflies. I keep track of them when they come to drink water. I have birds with a sweet tooth, like hummingbirds, and they come to drink sugar water, and none, none has disappeared, not one. At night, we even get bats, and I haven't seen any problems. I'm sure they hunt little animals, but, for example, when I clean the roof, I haven't seen dove feathers or from any bird. Given this, the impact of the cats has been very, as far as I can tell, small. A feral cat colony grows proportionally with the cat's reproduction. In Colombia, like in many countries in South America, this problem is on the rise. This phenomenon is international. It's a global phenomenon. The situation is the same everywhere. 
and the approach is very similar, including the capture, sterilization, and reintegration and monitoring of these populations. This phenomenon has grown as the custom of having animals for companionship has also risen, as our family structure and cultural conditions have changed. The numbers of, we now have less children, we live in smaller spaces, and people have a greater need for affection from sources outside of other people. Therefore, at the rate these changes occur, pets for companionship are seen more often in families and all over the world. As these pet populations grow, so too does the animal population outside. Why? Because we're not talking about other phenomena like the irresponsible ownership. Ownership of animals that live in the street, even though in theory they are someone's property. These animals are abandoned, and the animals aren't sterilized. In this way, it is we humans who are creating this phenomena. For this citizen who loves animals, it has worked out very well, because little by little the rest of his neighbors have accepted the colony. Well, in any case, we have made this a teaching experience. The La Perla Animal Welfare Center has gone around the block to converse with the neighbors to tell them about animal rights. And I myself, when I can, I've talked to the neighbors that have told me they're going to poison them or something. And I've said, no, you can't do that because they're animals. They're taken care of. Little animals have rights. Están cuidaditos, los animalitos tienen sus... These little animals are vaccinated, they're sterilized, they're protected, they have their chip, they have names, they're registered. We have to learn to live with them. And in general, the neighbors have behaved well. And the neighbors feel very happy about the work that's being done. It seems very good to me, the work that they do in castrating the animals so they can't reproduce all over the place. We can't forget that it's important to take into account that these animals have legal rights and that, at least in Colombia, the mistreatment of any animal can result in prison or fines for the perpetrator. They are all equally protected by the same international, national, provincial, and municipal rights. Squirrels, birds, dogs, and cats. We define fauna as every animal that is in our city, in a region, or in a space, under any condition and any status. Whether they're domestic, domesticated, wild, exotic, in captivity, in semi-liberty, or whether they are in a family, they all have the same rights to cohabitate and coexist on this planet. These cats, more than a mere inconvenience, can be a healthy solution to problems like rodents, cockroaches, and other insects. Helping to control these plagues, since they're vaccinated, they don't present a health risk to society. But one must recognize that they aren't like domestic cats. They're not pets, since the contact that they've had with humans has been very minimal. Domesticated animals are those that live with us under the same roof. They can coexist with us. They depend on our providing them with food and water and are our responsibility. When we say domesticated, we are really talking more about a natural process, an evolutionary process. Cats and dogs have been our companions in evolution, usually domesticated, and domestic animals live with us. Something happens with cats. Cats have been more than just our partners. Thanks to them, we are able to make agriculture flourish. Cleaning and managing their feces is a fundamental part of taking care of a cat colony. To do this, Luis has a system that allows him to keep his surroundings clean. It's getting late and Luis is drinking coffee in the presence of his two dogs before going into action. Before 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Luis starts his ritual by preparing food for the colony. It doesn't matter that while he sets up the stepladder to get up on the roof, his dog Berlin, a Labrador puppy he rescued from the streets and for whom he's searching for a new home, takes a bite or two from the cat's plate. Caticos. 
The cat's food is pretty much made by me and a neighbor. When we see that there are newborn kittens, we modify the food specially for the little ones or the mothers. We give special care to cats who are nursing, but it's been a while now since they've had any litters, so we just give them normal food. But yes, cat food. Luis didn't have to make any additional changes to his house or his roof in order for this colony to be healthy and safe. The cats simply look for shelter in roofs, holes, and various different spaces or openings in the buildings. Basically, I've had to fix the shingles on my house because, as you know, the cats run, they jump. The neighbors do the same, and when I can, I offer to fix their shingles. But other than that, no, we haven't seen any harm done or had any serious problems. It's very important that we are aware that animals are living beings that deserve respect and, just like us, they cry too. Their salvation is in our hands. The story of these cats could have been a sad one, since they are in the streets and they are susceptible to many diseases and to mistreatment. But thanks to the awareness that is being awakened in human beings, many colonies can have a happy ending. Much love, knowing that, much respect, knowing that on this planet, that this planet is not ours, that we're here coexisting with other beings that also came here with the same rights. Luis, who we could call the leader of the San Bernardo colony, leaves us with an important message so we may reflect on the coexistence of humans and animals on planet Earth. I understand, basically, that there are new laws, not just in Colombia, but worldwide, that give animals greater rights and that us human beings are more sensitive. We are more compassionate with the planet and with life itself, since we have to understand that animals are a part of our environment. So we should be creative, friendly, sensitive, and create healthy lifestyles for them and for us as well. This is a simple guide to create awareness that another solution exists to create more awareness and interest in the trap, neuter, return techniques so that among all of us, we can help these feral cat colonies. Let's educate ourselves and realize that the planet Earth does not only belong to us, 